Welcome back, everybody. This is John Malonke, your host for the Association of Cannabinoid Specialists. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Jordan Tischler, as well as Dr. Siraj Tandon. We're covering some uh, North America today, from uh, California to Massachusetts to uh, East Coast and in, in Canada. So always great to see you guys. Okay, here's a topic. I'm just going to get right to it. Um, it's one of the 140 different cannabinoids. Uh, each cannabinoid plays a role, and what we'd like to speak talk about talk about today is CBD. What do we really know about CBD? And this question comes up all the time, thinking that it's a uh, I, I always call it the Willy Wonka golden ticket, you know, a cure all. Never use the word cure, but the way the media and all the marketing around this 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 cannabinoid is is uh, hitting not only here in the U.S., Canada, of course, but globally. It, they're making it out to be the fountain of youth. And so what do we really know about CBD? And if Jordan, uh, why don't you take take it from here? You know, it's funny. Um, I was recently talking to somebody and they were like, Dr. Tischler, why are you so anti-CBD? And I guess they had been reading some things or misreading some things on, on LinkedIn that I had written. And I have to say, I'm not anti-CBD. Uh, I think that the issue I have at this point is really just that we don't have the data that we need. You know, there are uh, a, a vast array of studies on CBD done in cell culture um, and done in the mouse model, looking at everything from does CBD cure COVID on to, you know, what does it do for pain and what does it do for anxiety and such like that. Um, and all of that preclinical information is very exciting but we're very limited in how much we know about what actually happens in human beings. Now, we have really good data on the use of CBD as an anti-epileptic in children with Dravet syndrome and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. In my mind, that's a, a, a closed discussion. I think that that's been proven without question. It's really, you know, when, when we have adult patients coming in and saying insomnia, pain, and uh, anxiety, uh, you know, it's just very much up in the air. What we know from the GW studies has been that the doses needed to achieve that anti-epileptic effect were very large, somewhere in the 10 to 20 milligrams per kilo range, which is easy if you're talking about a little kid, right, who doesn't weigh very many kilos. But when you start to talk about an adult human who's, you know, 70 kilos, you start to realize we're talking about 700 to 1400 milligrams of CBD per day. Nobody's getting that. Nobody can afford that, let alone, you know, like even if you could find it. But we do know that there are other complications with CBD, like it can interact more commonly with conventional medicines than THC and other cannabinoids. And even there's some evidence from those early studies that high doses of CBD can create direct uh, liver toxicity, which doesn't happen very often, but it happens enough that it's something we have to pay attention to. So it's my feeling that the story just hasn't been written yet, and we need to get more data. And at some point, I actually do expect that CBD will turn out to be very useful, but it may be useful at much higher doses, at much higher cost, requiring insurance coverage, and possibly with sort of routine blood monitoring to make sure that things aren't going sideways. You know, you say, sorry, uh, Siraj, you, you mentioned, uh, Jordan, about insurance coverage. This comes up quite a bit. And it's still, this the insurance coverage, you know, has been, has been discussed as long as I've been in this industry for about 12, 13 years. And it's still being discussed. And I think until it needs to get out of the Schedule One classification of highly addictive, dangerous, uh, and this is the one I, I love, is that has no medical value. You know, it's not going to get to the level where it needs with one uh, st more studies and trials and and stuff like that. I know you're going to say something, but you know, the, the stigma about cannabis is starting to drop, and it's really starting to drop. When we all, we all jumped in this industry quite some time ago there was a major stigma about cannabis. I mean, people were like, nope, I don't wanna hear about it. I don't wanna talk about it. No, no, no. And now for the doctors that are listening to this, and I'm certain doctors, uh, you, your patients have been coming to you and saying, I'd like to try cannabis or I'd like to try CBD. You know, it's funny. I, a lot of my doctor colleagues send patients to me and say things like, uh, go talk to Dr. Tischler about CBD. 
You know, and so the patient arrives in my office expecting a discussion about CBD, and I'm saying, well, look, you're here for pain management associated with your metastatic, you know, cancer. Uh, CBD is not the right thing to be discussing. We need to talk about THC. And yes, it will come with some intoxication, but then every medicine has side effects. And our goal is to maximize benefit and minimize side effects. So, you know, it, it's kind of interesting that in many ways, you're right, the stigma is decreasing but in some ways, it's also that in that decrease, people are getting sort of um, uh, focused on the wrong aspect of it. And, and so, you know, there's a fair amount of time I have to spend kind of redirecting saying, you know, we just don't know that much about CBD. It doesn't yeah. seem to be uh, that, that valuable, except that it doesn't cause intoxication. But if we want to achieve you know, uh, better sleep, if we want to achieve pain control, if we want to control anxiety, um, nausea, vomiting, these are all THC dominant pro uh, products. And we have to sort of get past that next level of hurdle of, of stigma, which is CBD, good THC, bad, you know, or CBD, CBD, medical THC recreational. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, you know, so Sir, Siraj, we've been doing all the talking uh, south of the border here. What's going on up there? That's okay. I I, I certainly love listening to uh, your guys' perspective down there in the U.S. Uh, I think <laughs> here here in Canada and Toronto specifically, I could say uh, things are a lot different, um, which I I foresee probably the same changes occurring in the U.S. Hopefully in in the near future. Um, I'll make a couple of comments just to touch on some of the comments that you guys uh, already uh made but so one is i think here in canada since you know uh, cannabis has been really legal now recreationally since 2018 but medical cannabis going back to 2002 is that uh, yes i think i agree with some of the points is that cbd sort of kind of became the in in terms of uh greater interest from a medical perspective uh destigmatizing cannabis overall and so i think that was one of the maybe uh, desires about CBD as, a, as an initial agent to be utilized uh, compared to THC or other cannabinoids. And, and, and what I've seen here, uh, one is I want to first agree with Jordan. I think higher quality evidence and data is certainly lacking. Uh, we do know, as he's already mentioned, in terms of certain patient populations, particularly pediatric patient populations with refractory epilepsy, even here at uh, University of Toronto at SickKids, the study has been replicated to show that it can be utilized and it's safe to be utilized in those patient populations that found significant benefit. So that is certainly well established. Now, in terms of older adult patients suffering from various chronic disease, chronic pain, for example, um, and others, insomnia, um, I think the limiting factor and what we're seeing now in the last couple of years uh, is that cost is probably the limiting factor to getting more optimal symptom control. Um, I think in my experience, what I see quite commonly, and, I, and I'm certainly for CBD in the sense that one is it's sort of a preferred agent here in Canada because uh, one, it, it doesn't have the psychomotor impairing effects unlike THC. But again, I think it still uh, doesn't make THC as sort of a bad substance. Uh, but I think it's recognizing the unique patient population to use various types of cannabinoids. Secondly, um, I'll say in terms of uh, CBD, the, the side effects, there are certainly side effects with it. There are certainly drug-drug interactions. Uh, but what we're not seeing, obviously, is the psychomotor impairing the euphoria, although that can be a very pleasant effect. Uh, and so we have patients who want that. But the main thing is that they're still capable and able to uh, continue on with their professional careers, uh, whether they're working in safety sensitive positions. And what I've seen is why the interest of CBD has grown here in Canada is because legislation has made cannabis legal. But two, it's now recognizing that patients can utilize these substances for medical purposes. And so many patients want to return back to work. And so what we're still trying to tease out is developing HR policies. How can patients who are using medical cannabis for symptom relief still be able to maintain their jobs, still be able to practice or work safely? Uh, so I think that's more or less why I think CBD has kind of taken a, a strong interest, but certainly media also is kind of propelling that notion. Uh, I agree with Jordan in the sense that what we're recognizing now is perhaps a small incorporation of THC early on can help mitigate the, the excessive cost often at times with CBD for symptom relief. Um, but again, there's still that fear because the laws don't necessarily support that here in Canada in, in terms of if you're working in a safety sensitive position or if you're driving a vehicle, 
or operating some sort of uh, you know heavy machinery using or having some THC in your system is almost a bit of a deterrent. And so I think people are a bit more fearful of prescribing THC because of that notion. Um, so those are my two cents in it here. I've seen in my practice specifically, many patients who I think are certainly responders to CBD uh, at varying doses. There's no specific dose. Uh, it's really trial and error. I've seen people respond at the, you know, the lowest effective dose, you know, sometimes even two milligrams of CBD. Uh, others requiring 30, 40, 50 milligrams once, twice, or three times a day, and some not responding at all. And so that's when we sort of typically take the approach of maybe incorporating a little bit of THC, but then telling them that they can't do certain things like driving, an, uh, you know, driving a vehicle or taking care of children, et cetera. Uh, I think that's one of the prohibiting factors from really allowing THC to, to, to be explored more. You know, you, you made a point on uh, machinery, heavy machinery, machinery as well as driving. Uh, one thing that I do see a lot of patients do and being recommended by their doctors uh, out here in California, at least, is try it on the weekend. You know, try it when you're when you don't have other responsibilities. Uh, I'm, you know, 6'1", 195 pound, but my body's really sensitive to salt, butter, wine, even cannabis, uh, low amounts work for me of sublingual tinctures. Just to show you how CBD interacts differently in each body is I can take uh, a dropper full of CBD in the daytime. It gives me energy, helps with inflammation and joint pains. Um, uh, at nighttime, I can take two droppers of the same CBD and it becomes a sedative. You know, where some people are, are the opposite. Low levels can make them feel sleepy, higher levels make it. And so you both being uh, MDs, and what can you share for first-time patients that come into your office, but most importantly for the other doctors that are, are watching? I want to tell you about a randomized controlled trial of CBD that we just completed that will probably not be published anytime soon. <laughs> uh, so this was a well-done randomized controlled trial with several hundred patients in each arm uh, taking uh, an escalating dose of CBD over several weeks. And the treatment endpoint was control of anxiety. And the results, I think, were fascinating. 71% got benefit from the placebo arm. Wow. Wow. And no more got benefit from the CBD arm. And to me, that tells me a lot. But when I hear somebody saying, well, it gives me energy, but it gives, makes me sleepy, um, I think that those are, are understandable non-physiologic responses. And I think that to me, the, the vast uh, interest in CBD, aside from the non-intoxicating aspect of it, is how many Americans and possibly Canadians as well are so miserable that a placebo is just what they need to feel better? To me, the best way to address that is not through a placebo, but rather to try and figure out what the root causes are and maybe to fix our very broken society. Um, or the, the, mind of, the mind is a very powerful uh, without question. So let's cool address here. it as opposed to trying to. Fool. Yeah. The, the, one of the good things about Canada in terms of how they've uh, made cannabinoids accessible to patients is that uh, they have certainly enforced uh, and supervised in terms of the production of, of cannabinoids. So one thing that I feel quite confident and, and secure about is that when I, if and when I prescribe or authorize, I should say medical cannabinoids for symptom relief, um, I, I'm quite confident and safe that the product that we're often reauthorizing month after month is consistent in terms of the number of milligrams of THC to CBD, um, that it's often tested, it's, it's heavily regulated. I think that's one of the things, that, and I'm sure it's very convoluted in the US, is that you know a lot of times the patients have to go or providers have to recommend patients to go and get their product tested to ensure what they're buying is in fact pure. So that's one of the, the, the good things here in Canada I see is that it's making the, the process of providing or authorizing medical cannabis a lot safer because we know uh, what those products are. And in fact, early on in the, in the initial stages, going back several years ago, uh, I, I recognize even, and I had to sort of inform Health Canada that certain products that were being produced by certain companies who were well reputable in terms of licensed producers, 
at times we're initially making inconsistent products or the labels or the concentrations were inaccurate. And so that required a lot of feedback. I think a lot of collective work together uh, with licensed producers and the Canadian government to ensure that again, if patients are having access to these types of products, it needs to be, you know, it, it needs to be well verified that what they're getting is in fact pure, stable, and free of any other solvent. So I think hopefully, in the, in, you know, I, I would hope that in the future, uh, the U.S. will follow that same sort of uh, that path. Uh, again, just to really ensure patient safety. Um, that's sort of my this thoughts on this. This is fascinating, Suraj. You know, in Maine, of all places, their recreational products are well tested, but their medical te products are not tested at all, right? It's backwards. If you, I mean, they all should be tested, of course, but one would think that there would be a higher premium on testing the medical side, but because it came first, right, the politics weren't there to insist upon it. And, you know, you make a really good point, which is that every state in the U.S. is different about its regulations. And furthermore, people are buying these things online where there's no regulation at all. And we have study upon study showing contaminants, uh, whether those are heavy metals or pesticides and adulterants like benzodiazepines and, and uh, opioids uh, added to the CBD tinctures, et cetera. So yeah, it's really, um, it's great that Canada has been so buttoned down about it. Yeah, they're, they're good in that sense. Sorry, go ahead, John, I'll let you go in there and speak. No, no, it, it, that's one of my biggest pet peeves in this industry. And what, you know, I keep on going back to the media, but it's frustrating when you hear patients or doctors recommend go to the gas station, go to the grocery store. And not all CBD is created equal. Not all cannabis is created equal. And so what, what I share with patients and families and doctors, uh, being a patient advocate, is look for, if you're able to, a company that grows their own. If it's USDA certified that we have down here, uh, Siraj. Um, uh, testing results, make sure the test results. I'm a fan of six months or, or, or younger you know, be careful um, what you are recommending to your patient. Be careful what you're using for yourself. Ask questions, not only as patients, but ask questions, even if you're a doctor, you know, ask a colleague. I'm certain doctors have somebody in their Rolodex, um, like a Jordan Tischler or a Dr. Tandon, who know and are experts on medical cannabis that would be more than happy to share their wealth and knowledge when it comes to uh, the endocannabinoid system and uh, can cannabis. Um, do you want, would you like to add to that or do you want to kind of? You know, I just want to add that, you know, if people don't have a local cannabinoid expert, they should reach out to the Association of Cannabinoid Specialists. Um, we have a directory of qualified members on the website that people can look up. And obviously, if we're talking about people who are clinicians, uh, not only would we welcome them to join us to help, you know, with their education, but also to help. Uh, spread the word, and uh, we're available to answer those questions as needed. Thank you. And Dr. Tandon up yeah, there in, I, the, in Canada. I'd love, I'd love to leave, I think, three final comments. So one Please. is for, for all the patients uh, or non-patients listening out there who are tuned in today is, you know, if you're interested in perhaps incorporating CBD within your current healthcare regimen, the first thing I would say is speak to a healthcare provider because there are drug drug interactions, um, there are potential side effects, but there might be a therapeutic benefit for you specifically. And I think it's important to speak with a healthcare provider, whether it's a doctor, nurse practitioner, that's the first step that I would say, rather than trialing and erroring, you know, on your own by going through the recreational market or trying a product that you're not too sure about. Uh, that's what I tell patients here. And I think that's the, the first step. And doctors really nowadays, I think, are becoming more cognizant and aware and receptive to cannabinoids as an effective treatment modality. Um, if you find a provider who's willing to support you in that regard, then that's great. If you find a provider who's not really, you know, really sure, uh, or maybe perhaps they're, you're, you're a bit too afraid to ask them about it, try and sit down, just, you know, have an open discussion first. I think providers are changing their opinions about it for the providers or health providers who are listening, uh, today, I would highly encourage you. Uh, one is you might have an interest in learning more about this. And I think ACS is a wonderful medium, a platform, an organization to support best evidence practice. That's what we sort of press on. Um, it's patient advocacy and policy uh, reform regulation. So I think if you're interested, certainly check our website out. 
Um, all of us are certainly uh, interested and heavily involved in education. I think that's the first step uh, that may change our opinions. Uh, you might find more information now that's evidence-based and that's what our take is. Um, but if you also need support or if you feel that you know, perhaps uh, you, know, you don't feel comfortable or have the time uh, to learn about it, then certainly we can put you in touch with you know, those providers or help your patients out uh, in that setting as well. We Perfect. do monthly mentoring sessions for clinicians. So that would be a good way to get toes in the water. Canaspecialist.org. Canaspecialist.org. And I appreciate you, Dr. Jordan Tischler, Dr. Shiraz Tandon, and I'm John Malanka, the Association of Cannabinoid Specialists. And we will see you at our next casual conversation. Wishing everyone a wonderful day.